and welcome to Father Spitzer's Universe, the intersection of faith and reason, where ideas and concepts collide on a regular basis. I'm Doug Keck, your host, coming to you from our EWTN studios on Mother Angelica Way in the heart of Irondale, Alabama. Part two, mysticism in the Catholic tradition. We started talking about it last week with Father Spitzer. And we have more questions on this topic. You can email us those questions at spitzersuniverse at EWTN.com. Post your questions on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash EWTN online, hashtag FSUniverse, of course. And if you so choose, send us a tweet at twitter.com forward slash EWTN, hashtag FSUniverse. All things Father Spitzer, the Magis Center is the place to be. The website is Magis Center, one word and it's magiscenter.com. And don't forget, we've got some new books coming up, Mother Angelica's Quick Guide to the Sacraments, and also Father Spitzer's new books coming out as well. And we'll have a special announcement at the end of the show talking about how we're going to deal with that book in the coming weeks right here on this program. With that said, let us travel to our West Coast studios and rejoin Father Spitzer once again in Orange County, California, on the campus of Christ Cathedral, the wonderful Diocese of Orange, which is uh, so nice to <laughs> not only host EW10 Studio, but also uh, uh, the, your Magis Center there is also located there, correct? Absolutely, right above uh, this fine studio. In fact, if uh, I built a fireman's pole right from my office down, it would co go right down here and I'd be sitting in this chair, uh, just sliding down the pole. It'd be a great entrance for the show. That, that's, we were, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> I was just talking to Len Marino in charge of creative services and we were working on some various promotional pieces. So maybe since you have a great love for the Three Stooges, uh, we could maybe work something in like that. Uh, maybe a little photoshopping into some Three Stooges events uh, as, we, as we talk about the mystery. Because a lot of people would think, a lot of, uh, of women, and certainly a lot of our moms used to figure out, what's the mystery of the attraction of the Three Stooges? Because uh, to young yeah. men, right? <laughs> Why are you watching right. that well, stuff? Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Because it seemed funny. At the, at the time, yeah. Still does. That's right. Yeah, well, guys like that physical humor. I think that was probably the attraction. Oh, well. yeah. Okay, oh, with, yeah. That, with that being Absolutely. the case, let's, let's get on to it because yeah. we have got a lot of questions sure. already lined up. Mysticism in the Catholic Church. Now, okay. here's somebody had a question uh, predicated on something sure. you said in the past. I think they might actually heard a replay on radio on a recent show. A viewer okay. asked uh, Father Spitzer to elaborate on the existence of fire in hell. Now, Father Spitzer's response was that the word fire was being used as a metaphor. This left me with the opinion that there's no fire in hell. Yet, according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, 1034 and 1035, as well as Matthew 13, fire does exist in hell. I think also we didn't include it. They referenced, obviously, the image Our Lady showed uh, the shepherd children of fire. So when we talk about the idea of fire in hell, what are we saying? Is it a metaphor? Is it real? Do we know? Uh, well, you know, I'm, uh, clearly uh, Jesus uh, compares it in the Gospel of Matthew uh, to Gehenna, uh, which uh, is basically a, a, you know, a field outside of Jerusalem where trash has been thrown and, you know, there, there, there's a fire going on there and the coals are still going on. And so Jesus does use uh, the expression, um, uh, certainly. Now, does that mean that Jesus was using it literally or that he was uh, using this uh, metaphorically? Uh, no exegete can say definitively and, and no exegete really tries to claim, uh, you know, th th they know the answer. I mean, uh, John L. McKenzie thinks that it, it's, it's, it's metaphorical for the pain of hell, uh, which is the pain of separation from God and the pain of being in the darkness of separation from God and the pain of being in the absence of love. But I mean, uh, does it uh, in include uh, uh, some fire to kind mm -hmm. of stoke that up? Uh, maybe it does. Uh, maybe it doesn't. I, I don't have a, 
uh, you know, um, you know, right now an ability to to determine uh, what Jesus was uh, was saying, whether I should take it literally or allegorically. Uh, certainly, um, you know, uh, uh, again, you know, at Fatima, the the Blessed Virgin gave a vision to the children there. Uh, fire is certainly included in that. Uh, is this vision uh, a vision of what is, is going on specifically uh, uh, in hell? If it is, then we can infer from that uh, that there's uh, fire in hell, if, if that uh, is how she intended it, right. um, you know, or whether that is in fact pointing uh, to the pain of separation from God, the pain of the absence of love, the pain of domination by others, and, and of course, the pain of being in the terrorizing presence uh, of the evil spirit. Um, you know, uh, I, I just, you know, cannot say for certain, uh, but, um, you know, uh, ab Catholics are free to believe uh, as they wish, you know, um, you know, in, in, in this regard. And, uh, uh, you know, if, uh, if literal fire is, is uh, it's certainly a possibility. It certainly uh, could be, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, a, a reference mm -hmm. to the condition there. Right. Uh, but it wouldn't have to be because the pain absolutely of being in the terrorizing presence of the evil spirit and separated from God and in real loneliness right. and emptiness, uh, you know, under the domination of evil would be far worse right. than any fire you could possibly dream up. So, um, you know, uh, we've got a, a yeah. great deal of latitude there. Um, you well, know, the, pick it as you wish. And I would think also just the idea, obviously the pain is not metaphorical one way or the other. That is there. It is intense. However that is accomplished, obviously, you know, we need to understand right. and, and realize ourselves with a theophany or a, a mystical experience like that, even with the children, that they can only understand uh, what they're seeing in terms of what they know, right? Oh, exactly. And clearly, you know, the Blessed Virgin Mary is tailoring these things uh, for for what you know they are able to comprehend and and what they're you know, remember those th the three children were were basically uneducated mm -hmm. you know and so they're you know they're looking at things metaphorically now of course Lucy later uh, is given a great deal of education uh, you know in her training in in the in the monastery so for all intents and purposes she turns out to be extremely well educated and seems to have believed. Uh, uh, you know that that the uh, the image was uh, you know uh, the real thing, and that that fire was uh, was there present. So maybe in you know as her later recollections might suggest even further that that uh, fire is really present. But as I said, you know one way or another, whether it is or whether it isn't, um, you know it's a painful right. place. Right. Jesus is trying to warn us against choosing it and trying to warn us against choosing it because it's worse than anything we right. can imagine, even though, of course, the evil one is deceiving us into believing this is the best choice for you. Right. So uh, anyway, there it is, uh, you, okay. you know, uh, but good question. Right, right, and it's always good for people to keep us on our toes, right? And uh, if there's a oh, misunderstanding yeah, sure. for us, get a chance yeah. to clarify, that would be a wonderful opportunity. Sure. Let's move ahead. It's another question uh, from a different program. Toward the end of a recent program on contemplation, you began speaking of quote yep. unquote, psychic powers. Please forgive my ignorance, but I found myself unsure of what you were speaking about. Psychic power seems egocentric. Would not entering into the contemplative prayer be a grace granted by God? And this is from Cookie. Well, Cookie, uh, it certainly is a <laughs> grace mandated by God. Uh, it, what we do is we uh, receive it through our spirit. And uh, the, the technical word, if I use psychic power there, I might have been trying to be illustrative, but mm. uh, the technical word that the, the mystics use, and certainly John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, what they're saying is the spirit is the place where the connection is made uh, uh, between God uh, and uh, me, Bob Spitzer, or the mystic. Mm -hmm. And of course, then, um, uh, you know, we have the soul and we have uh, the body uh, with its brain. And so, uh, uh, but to know that the typical place is the spirit, and maybe I was trying to illustrate it in some way, but certainly not trying to. Uh, 
you know, put God out of the picture, or certainly not trying to uh, replace that term uh, with uh, the, the term spirit. So thank you for the clarification. Certainly, um, um, I, I'm not sure what I was uh, trying to right. illustrate there, but the technical term is spirit, and, uh, and that's the place uh, of the connection right. with God. Uh, the, and of course, the soul mediates uh, between the spirit and the body. Uh, and of course, it too uh, is something uh, of um, uh, you know obvious uh, transphysical nature. So the soul is also transphysical as well as the spirit. Right. Well, no one uh, uh, accuses you of being Kreskin. We're not talking about psychic powers on a regular basis <laughs> on this program. We're talking about spiritual insights and mystical experiences, right. which are a tad different. Yeah. Okay. So let, let, let's let's move on to another question. Okay. This one having to do with mysticism. But hope this one's not a curveball. Yeah. Uh, in the Eastern Orthodox yeah. Church, we have a mystic tradition mm -hmm. called Hesychism. Okay, Hesychism, yes. or Hesychasm, uh -huh. I should say. Yeah. In the past, however, this yeah. movement has had some controversy in the Catholic Church. What are the modern views yeah. of the Catholic Church towards the practice of Hesychasm? And this is a Brother Fastrius. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know what okay. it is, so that's a good yeah. start. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, here, here's the, the uh, in, in Eastern uh, uh, mysticism, I mean, I don't mean Eastern mysticism, I mean uh, Eastern Orthodoxy uh, and uh, the Eastern Church in particular, um, we do have a, a, a strain of mysticism which later gets incorporated uh, into the Catholic Church. And that strain of mysticism is oriented toward uh, knowledge or uh, gnosis and, um, and uh, you know, the, the idea of getting this knowledge, right, this enlightenment, uh, is, you know, basically through a form in Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite, right, um, he, he is a very important Eastern mystic who, in many ways, was influenced by Philo of Alexandria, who was a, a Jewish uh, Platonist. But the idea, though, that is uh, gnosis for Pseudo Dionysius uh, will come through the negation of everything that I, I, I know, every image, right? And, and we call it the apophatic way. So you, you basically negate and you ne negate and negate. The Eastern Church, of course, uh, makes an important distinction because by negating everything, you come into what Pseudo Dionysius calls the darkness, or you go into the cloud of unknowing, mm -hmm. a very Eastern you know, approach. It almost sounds like Eastern mysticism in the sense of Eastern Asian mysticism mm -hmm. where uh, you, you look like you're going to get absorbed uh, into the divine. And so the term um, uh, used there is to try and distinguish um, uh, Western mysticism uh, from uh, a, a sort of absorption into the divine, which, by the way, you know, Philo of Alexandria almost tended in that direction, whereas in the Christian uh, Eastern Orthodox mystical tradition, um, it, that is not the case. In fact, um, what um, uh, you know, sort of Dionysius trying to say is that when we uh, do all of these negations and we kind of uh, you know move into the cloud of unknowing, we are not ultimately absorbed into the absolute. The absolute literally takes our unique goodness and lovability and fills us with itself through our surrender. And so we then, you know, become completely enlightened. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened, um, you know, is that, uh, you know, the, the Western view of mysticism, going back all the way to the time, I'm sorry, I'm getting into this history a little bit, uh, you know, in, in detail here, but all going all the way back to the time of Ignatius of Antioch. And remember, Ignatius of Antioch uh, is, is, you know, he's writing, he's, he's the the number one uh, apostolic father, right? He is, you know, as close to the, you know, to Saint John uh, the Evangelist as you're going to get. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, he 
already is, you know, founding a mystical tradition. But that mystical tradition is not an apophatic mystical tradition. It's not, you know, negating, you know, images and things as you would find in Pseudo Dionysius. And by the way, Pseudo Dionysius wrote a whole treatise on mystical theology, mm -hmm. which is uh, very, very important uh, in, in Christian mystical tradition. But Ignatius of Antioch, he begins with a different starting point, namely the passion of Christ. And so here, instead of negating images, we are literally through Ignatius putting an image right in the center of the mystical tradition. Namely, the passion of Jesus is the beginning of falling in love with the humble Jesus, falling in love with the completely self-sacrificing Jesus, nay, falling in love with the unconditionally loving Jesus. And the deeper we reflect on that passion, the more we discover, right, uh, the love of God, the unconditional love of God. And of course, the more we allow ourselves to enter into that, the more we in turn are filled with that love. Mm -hmm. Now, let's, uh, so we see two strains of mysticism kind of coming about, and uh, we'll see with Carmelite spirituality how be, they begin to be blended, but even before that. There's one last figure, if I could just point it out, and this is Saint Anthony of the Desert, sometimes called Saint Anthony the Great. He's the first real uh, anchorite monk. He's the first uh, hermit, really. Uh, uh, he's not the first hermit. There's other hermits before him, but he is the, the first one to kind of set out a, a, a hermetical theology, as it were. And he, he's got this uh, biography done by Athanasius, uh, St. Athanasius. And, and in there, uh, you know, we see that uh, mysticism is viewed in terms of spiritual combat with the devil. So that you put yourself into a completely ascetical situation. You go out into the desert. Why the desert? That's the place where the demons are to be encountered. What are you looking for? You're looking for purification from the senses. And, and not just purification from the senses, but purification from the evil spirit who can work through those senses, right, in their excess and can work through my pride and these other deadly sins that we've talked about. And so by doing, going to the desert, by becoming extremely ascetical, by doing combat with the devil, by rejecting the devil, finally the soul is purified. And, and of course, this in a sense is a whole other strand of mysticism. Now, by the time, you know, we're getting into a kind of Benedictine period, right, mm -hmm. St. Benedict, right, and, the, and the, the monasteries that begin to flow, right, Basil the Great and so forth, we're seeing the combination of all of these things, mm -hmm. right? And, and, you know, Benedict was aware of these earlier church fathers, certainly aware of uh, St. Um, um, uh, Ignatius of Antioch, certainly aware of St. Irenaeus, certainly aware of of St. Jerome. He's also aware of Anthony uh, the Great. He's also aware of uh, the uh, Pseudo Dionysius, the, this, this Eastern uh, mystical tradition. And now all of a sudden we get this kind of flavor of Christian mysticism that has all three strands that are blending. And of course in St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, all three strands come to a kind of unique Christian mystical tradition. God is in charge, right, of, of everything, but they do have these three components woven into it very, very distinctly, you know, as God is taking charge of the soul. But it, it does have a component of asceticism. Mm -hmm. It does have a component of purification and combat with uh, uh, the, the, the evil spirit, with the evil one, uh, with the devil. It does have a component mm -hmm. of, of literally going to the highest possible theological view of God into the unknowing, into the cloud, in, into, you know, uh, almost looks like a, an emptiness, but the emptiness is just full of the divine substance, right? Uh, you know, and, and, and that uh, the Eastern tradition that our, our uh, um, um, uh, questioner is talking about, right. and it absolutely always has the 
passion of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the unconditional love of Jesus, who's taking control mm -hmm. of my soul and bringing me to the fullness of love through the meditation, the contemplation on his passion. So if you look really at the Catholic mystical tradition, you know, starting, uh, yes, with Benedict, but of course being articulated in the high Middle Ages, uh, and then of course, uh, and, and certainly with Julian of Norwich and, and so forth, but also, uh, you know, in the 15th, right. 16th century with St. Teresa of Avila, oh, certainly, uh, you know, um, the Jesuit patron St. Uh, Ignatius of Loyola, certainly St. John of the Cross has all three elements, I mean, he's extremely allegorical, extremely philosophical, you know, in that, mm -hmm. in that Eastern sense, extremely, uh, you know, and just totally taken with the love of God through right. the passion of Jesus Christ and the meditation of the passion, and certainly also the combat for the purification of the senses and, and the combat with the devil to the purification of the spirit. You, you can see uh, this unique right. uh, Catholic mystical tradition, which is so rich, so deep, so diversified, and the interplay between those three strands is is, is very very clear. So the, I know that I went way beyond the questioner's question, but but uh, nevertheless, mm -hmm. you, you can see it in context. The the the, the Latin Church did have some problems uh, mm -hmm. early on, just because of this unknowingness, and because we had such a strong tradition of mysticism beginning with the passion of Jesus but of course it gets totally incorporated and that's, uh, uh, into and, uh, our tradition right. later. And that all started with he see chasm and I can see a chasm too, a chasm yeah. between what you're <laughs> talking good. about and, and a lot of our audience <laughs> to understand the deep mysticism and that's why we have a program like this so we can clarify some of this and of course we're talking about mysticism in the Catholic good. Church. We're going to take a quick break but much more ahead with the one and only Father Spitzer as we continue right here in the midst of his universe. Stay with us. in the Catholic Church, part two, our tradition. And once again, we're joined by Father Robert Spitzer uh, from his studio out there in California and the campus of Christ Cathedral. Uh, beautiful, beautiful location, as people can see. And if you happen to be out on the West Coast, of course, you make sure you stop by uh, the Christ Cathedral campus and, and get to see the Christ Cathedral, which uh, here's some images you can see, which was the old uh, Crystal Cathedral, very, very well known many years right. on television. Just a couple of shots, a beautiful place to go and visit. Now a, an incredibly Catholic uh, location and a real location of Catholic culture out there in Southern California. So we've got uh, another question for Father Robert Spitzer. Father, sure. how does the Catholic Church know who is considered a mystic and what defines one? And this is from Andrea. Well, Andrea, that is a very good question. You know, the Catholic Church, um, you know, doesn't really uh, classify, uh, you know, saints as uh, mystics. A lot of um, uh, theologians do. Uh, the Church really just talks about whether a person is a saint or not a saint. Uh, sometimes uh, we refer to them as, you know, spiritual masters, right? Um, but essentially, uh, it's more theologians um, who study the whole area of mystical theology um, and study the area of prayer and uh, the spiritual life that really do talk about that. So um, we see, you know, the, I mean, if, you, if to give a general theological definition of mysticism, uh, I would just go back to the definition I gave last time, okay. right, that uh, our whole attempt in Christian theology is to fall uh, so deeply in love with God that we achieve union with Him. Remember, though, that in the Christian tradition, union does not mean absorption into the absolute. Mm -hmm. It means that we find the fullness of our uniquely good and lovable selves, which are brought 
to fruition through our union in love, right? Because love is interpersonal, right? Mm -hmm. There's got to be another person there uh, to be relating to. So that uh, interpersonal love brings us to our fruition through the union with the Lord who brings us to it. So um, uh, now a mystic is generally a person who has during this lifetime experienced uh, this this love, right? This 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 union with God, and uh, uh, we have a, a large number of people and a large number of of mystical traditions uh, in which this has happened. Normally, when there is union with God, three things do occur besides the self being brought to the fullness of itself through God. Uh, the first thing that happens uh, is is uh, what you might call the feeling uh, of of ecstasy. But ecstasy is is not just a feeling; it's a kind of a uh, you know a joy uh, mm -hmm. that that comes you know out of myself, uh, you know, being outside of myself, ecstasies, right? So I'm, I'm I'm coming outside of myself. But more than that, um, the the association, the feeling associated with it, as I said, are unity, mm -hmm. home, love joy, sacredness, all of these things are blended together and mixed with God's special signature. Mm -hmm. So that is a, a huge dimension of union. A second dimension of union, as I just implied in the last question, uh, is you know, the, the purification of the soul from what we might call the seven deadly sins. First, those uh, sins associated with the senses, and then uh, the sins associated with the spirit. So those include gluttony, drunkenness, lust, sloth, and then of course the, the, uh, the more spiritual ones, the greed, envy, anger, and you might divide uh, pride uh, into vanity and the, 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 the love of power Mm -hmm. right, um, uh, d dominating other people. So that we have a complete purification of these things <clears throat> so that literally there's no more ego and there's no more sensorial attachment to stand in the way between a perfectly authentic, transparent love of the Lord who is in turn just completely capable of shining through to us. That's what's causing uh, that ecstasy to occur. And, and so, it, you know, that, that this purification of love happens. And of course, the third thing uh, that is happening is we find our truly individual, that is to say, our uniquely good uh, selves, we find that, discover that in complete authenticity uh, so that we know, of course, that we peeled off the layers upon layers of the onion of authentic inauthenticity, mm -hmm. excuse me, of inauthenticity. We peel those off to get to the core of our authentically good, um, uh, uniquely good uh, self, mm -hmm. uh, which of course is what we pour out, uh, you know, um, uh, to the Lord through the purification uh, of that love, which in turn leads to the life of ecstasy. Uh, we can, in the kingdom of heaven, we'll be able to turn to everybody else, all the blessed in the kingdom of heaven, and we'll be able to share that same ecstasy. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, it's so profound, uh, you know, the mystics, you know, describe it as, you know, time is standing still, right? I mean, it, or a still point or, uh, you know, something of that nature. I mean, you, you just don't even notice uh, the passage of time. I mean, if I, I could give an analogy to it, it might be something like, you know, you're at a, a, a wonderful, um, a, you know, a restaurant or something with your friends and you're enjoying a, a, a nice meal, a glass of wine, and mm -hmm. the conversation, you know, just keeps going and it keeps going. And you are no longer really so much concerned with the conversation, but you just begin to become at home with all these people you're with mm -hmm. to the point where you really lose track of time. Mm -hmm. And finally some guy just looks at his watch at, at four in the morning and he goes, oh my gosh, it's four in the morning, where did the time go? Right. Indeed, where did it go? Well, we might say lost in love. Well, if this can happen sort of in a very little way on a human level, you know, think for a second of what that would be 
with a completely non-egotistical, non-sensorially impaired, transparent, perfectly authentic love with God, mm -hmm. with the triune God. I mean, at that juncture, uh, you know, John 15, 11 comes to its fruition, right? Uh, that my love might be, uh, that my joy might be yours and your joy mm -hmm. may be complete. Wow, that's almost like an understatement that your joy, now that we get these writings of St. Teresa, we know what Jesus was feeling in communion with God, even in the anticipation mm -hmm. of the upcoming, uh, uh, you know, passion, crucifixion and, and, and death. Uh, we know uh, the joy he felt. We know the ecstasy that, that we're headed for. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is going to be the divine banquet squared where we not only see God, right. uh, you know, as he is, we get to see everybody else in their unique lovability and goodness, you know, without any ego obfuscation of any kind. And, and we're just literally taken right into right. the heights of that joy. Of, of John 15 11. Okay. So anyway, that's that's just uh, something to chew on. Right. It's, it's very, very profound, but it, it uh, it's articulated by most of the mystics right. uh, in the in the Catholic mystical tradition. Yeah, it sounded a little like uh, dinner at Jones there uh, you were describing earlier as far <laughs> as <laughs> yeah. wonderful She'll company. She'll get a kick and, out of that. Right, the time Oh yes, time wonderful company. Right, right, she exactly. can make this time, time stand still. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So let's move on to another question here. Hello, Father Spitzer. Yeah. I heard it said that St. Hildegard was a visionary and a prophetess, but not yes. a mystic. Mystic saints usually seem quite different from the Old Testament prophets, as God delivers messages to us through mystics and prophetics differently, or prophets differently. What all is the difference between mystics and prophets? And this is Nikki. Okay, well, prophecy, uh, you know, mystics, by the way, St. Hildegard uh, of Bingen, if somebody said she wasn't a mystic, I am utterly perplexed. She has all of the characteristics in spades of all the, the, the strands of mysticism that I talked about earlier on, along with the, the unique ecstasy that they, you know, the, the, completely bowled over by the beauty of God, the beauty of the goodness of his law, the beauty of the goodness of Jesus in the passion. I mean, if she's not a mystic, uh, you know, who is? So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, this, this is a very interesting uh, uh, classification, but I, I, I probably would have to say I, I strongly disagree. She, she, Be that mm -hmm. as it may, mm -hmm. uh, though, uh, Hild you know, she did have uh, prophetic uh, uh, tendencies, but uh, remember prophecy is one of the great gifts we're given, uh, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we're given that, that St. Paul talks about and talks about quite a bit uh, a, a, as a matter of fact. Uh, remember that prophecy, both in the, in the Jewish tradition and also in, in the Christian tradition, is, is not a, a, like an oracle who is predicting the future. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, there were a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, surrounding uh, nations around Israel that viewed prophecy in that way, but that was not the Israelite view of prophecy, nor Jesus' view of prophecy, nor St. Paul's view of prophecy, nor the kind of prophetic, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, um, you know, tradition uh, that uh, um, Hildegard represents. Mm -hmm. So let's just uh, kind of go back and say, well, what was the difference between oracle on the one hand, like you say in a, in a pagan uh, religion, versus um, a, a Jewish prophet? The mm -hmm. Jewish prophet and the Christian prophet has a point, a message to deliver, not just for Israel, but in the case of the Christian prophet, a message to deliver for the world. So it's always delivered, <coughs> excuse me, in a conditional. Mm -hmm. If Israel, uh, it, you know, um, wants to, uh, you know, remain in the graces of God and be protected from its enemies, then it will have to do A and B and C, right? So we notice that every Old Testament prophet is saying, there, you know, Israel's fallen short. There are some conditions that have to be met. Now, here's where the kind of prophetic part, you know, in terms of the predicting of the future comes forward. If Israel does not do this, then definitely Israel 
uh, will you know be invaded by the Babylonians or the Assyrians or whoever it might be, but depends on the prophet, right? Mm -hmm. And something destructive or tragic is going to happen. But if Israel obeys, then God will relent, and this will not happen. Now, of course, we see, uh, uh, like, if you take a look at, uh, you know, just the, the, the prophetic element of Our Lady of Fatima, which we were just talking about uh, last week, you can certainly see in terms, you know, the prophetic condition mm -hmm. that's there with respect to repentance and, 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 uh, and uh, saying, um, uh, you know, consecrating ourselves to the Lord for the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, for the uh, uh, repentance of Russia and, and so forth. And you right. can sort of... It's, Great. That if-then proposition mm -hmm. is is there, and and at that point, if we consecrate, you know, um, uh, Russia to the Lord, uh, maybe you know this whole horrible atheistic communistic uh, system will come to an end, and you know the reign of terror and Stalin and so forth will come to an end. And indeed, it did. I mean, mm -hmm. we were. I mean, I'm looking at there at Boris Yeltsin on the TV, you know, kind of saying this is going to be a whole new era. This is the end of the Soviet Union. And he standing on a tank and I'm thinking my gosh that prophecy sure came true right. well when I said came true what I mean is it was fulfilled because of course people had consecrated Russia they had said uh, the the requisite prayers and, and so forth uh, for rosary. that uh, prophecy right. yeah. uh, that's right and to pray the rosary and and uh, the prayer of consecration at the end of mass you know as mandated by actually uh, several popes right. so we've got you know a, a really um, a good example there but uh, but that's the idea of a prophet and yes Hildegard did have that kind of uh, prophetic uh, element to her. But remember, that's not just predicting the future. That's saying, if you do this, then this will, uh, a good thing will happen. If you don't do this, then something else is going to happen. Not so good. Right. And of course, uh, that's very much the, the Jewish prophetic tradition. It, it goes right into right. Jesus, right into the uh, Christian prophetic tradition. And Hildegard was one of those, but not all mm. mystics do make those predictions. Okay. So you, you might you might have to say that, you know, they, they do have their own, you know, one's a, a gift of the Holy Spirit and, you know, there are prophets and they have that gift. And there are also the mystics oh. who come into union with God and tell us what that joy is like and what that union is like. And, and they have a, right. a different charism. And sometimes, as in Hildegard of Bingen, uh, you get the two right. of them blended very, very nicely. Right. Right, exactly. And as you indicated, when I talk about the Oracle of Delphi, who, you know, found a good cave that had yeah. good acoustics that worked out quite well for yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah. being, being somewhat prophetic <laughs> there. Can, have you All ever right. met anyone that you thought was a mystic? Oh, Oh, indeed. I, I, I've, a, couple, a couple of Jesuits, I, I, I probably shouldn't tell this story, but um, he'll probably, uh, I'll just call him Father L. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people in my community at, at Seattle U, where I had taught previously, will know who Father L is because uh, he, he wouldn't want me to say his name on television and call him a mystic because he was too humble. Mm -hmm. He was absolutely too humble. But let's, uh, his name started with L and everybody at the Seattle uh, used Jesuit community, we called him our community mystic, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, it was so clear uh, by the look in his eyes, it was so clear by the joy that, that was underneath uh, you know, his eyes, his expression, his wisdom, yet at the same time, uh, you know, Father L had, he had his challenges and difficulties in his life, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'll just tell you the story. I, I'm walking down the hall one day and Father L is coming down the opposite side of, of the corridor from me. I'm going out of my room this direction, he's coming in the other direction, and he's saying, <laughs> I mean, don't laugh too hard, Doug, he's <laughs> saying, to God, you're so beautiful. And he's, he's I mean, literally enraptured mm -hmm. by God, pro, you know, telling God, you're so beautiful. And of course, I'm coming down the, the corridor on the other side, and mm -hmm. I said, 
uh, I know who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. And of course, he kind of snapped out of it for a second, you know, and it kind of went back to his rapture. But I just thought, you know, uh, you know, there is a perfect example, you know, that he has just uh, didn't even really, he wasn't right. even aware that I was coming down the, the hall. He's just, uh, just there with God, completely in union, talking to God is, is beautiful, a very typical mystical thing to do. And of course, he, he was well known. Mm -hmm. Every spiritual directee loved him. And there were many such people uh, like that. I mean, honestly, just uh, uh, there, there are absolutely contemporary mystics and they're okay. the, just, you're blessed to know them, meet them, be friends with them. Right. But of course, they're with God and their friendship with God is to be shared with everybody. Right. I could say that having been at EW10 for 21 years, I can say I have encountered several people I thought might be. And certainly uh, oh, our foundress yeah. had certain abilities there that I think people know about oh, as well. Yeah. So we're going to take a break. Oh, we're I, here with you know, Father Spitzer. <laughs> Sorry, Father, as we uh, take one last break, as we wrap up the program coming up, we've got mysticism in the Catholic tradition. Much more ahead right here on Father Spitzer's Universe, the place to be. Mysticism in the Catholic tradition. We continue here in Father Spitzer's universe with some more of your questions. Father Spitzer, let me ask you this one just came in from Facebook. Can natural law apl be applied to people who say anything, or can natural law be applied to anything regarding mysticism? How does mysticism connect with morality or virtue? This is Andrew. So now we're talking about something called the natural law that we hear a lot, especially when we're talking about morality here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, of course, natural law um, is uh, one of the, uh, uh, you know, great prides of the Catholic Church in terms of the development of ethics. And it's a, uh, 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 you know, obviously has its greatest articulation in St. Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theologica. And uh, it is a very long treatise, uh, 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 you know, to, to go into here. Uh, the, the main thing, of course, is that you know there is conscience, um, you know, uh, uh, you know that stands at the center of this, or Sindaris, which stands at the center of, of Thomas Aquinas, Saint Thomas Aquinas's uh, uh, view. You know that, that that we have, in a way, all of us, you know, have a connection with God, where we are not only aware of good and evil and uh, we can differentiate good and evil in general ways and we can also uh, have the sense when, when we uh, anticipate doing evil uh, that there's a sense of guilt and shame uh, and, and if we do evil there's a sense of guilt uh, after the fact self-alienation mm -hmm. or if we're doing good the sense of, of, of being at home with God the sense of nobility and, and, and of serving the mission of God you know, so there's there's feelings associated with this. There's a state of being connected with God or being alienated from God. There's also, uh, you know, a, a state of, of knowledge, uh, you know, that's there. So in that sense, the mm -hmm. natural law is dependent on this and there's this on this this awareness of, of God's uh, law, good and evil, and and uh, and uh, you know t uh, the the impetus to do good, to avoid evil, and and the Incompetent feelings and states attendant upon doing good and doing evil. Mm -hmm. in, in a way, since that comes from God, in a way it's it's almost mystical. And and certainly John Henry Cardinal Newman, who wrote an entire uh, tractate on conscience uh, as coming from God and tries to describe it, uh, you know, as as literally almost uh, not not the voice literally from God, but but uh, you know God's. Uh, you know, uh, inner voice speaking to us in in a very fatherly and 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 beautiful yet call to responsibility yet you know sense of alienation if we do evil sense of nobility if we do good in that sense sees it as a kind of 
uh, mystical thing in the sense of being connected with God, being, you know, uh, literally addressed by God, you know, during our every waking hour. So we might call it a very low level generic uh, sort of mystical relationship, but it you wouldn't want to say it's what you know, people mean by mysticism in the high sense of mysticism where the purification takes place, right? Um, you know, that, that the authentication the authentication of love takes place, that mm -hmm. the ecstasy is, is, is a normal part of, of, of life where union is actually taking place. So you, you wouldn't w want to say that, but yes, in, in a way, there is a connection uh, in the natural uh, law through conscience toward the mystical mm -hmm. tradition. Now, um, uh, you could say there's another kind of a connection, too, because after all, we could judge an authentic mystic from an inauthentic mystic, right, by, uh, you, know, the, you know, whether they're orthodox or whether mm -hmm. they're not orthodox. Now, all the, the various people that we call Catholic mystics today, mm. you know, obviously been judged by the, the church to be quite orthodox. And, uh, you know, so in, in that sense, you know, uh, could natural law be a way of, of, you know, making a judgment about uh, orthodoxy? Well, in general, but remember, natural law is what's natural to you. St. Thomas Aquinas also has a, a whole other uh, you know, a uh, sense of the law, mm -hmm. you know, which is a revealed law, which is the law that comes uh, from God himself. And that's more theological. And so the church judges that, right? Uh, you know, that theological, that sense of the law, it's really not the natural law mm -hmm. who would judge a true versus a false uh, mystic. It's, it's really going to be mm -hmm. the divine law, uh, you know, the, the a supernatural law, the revealed law, uh, you know, as it is interpreted by the, the magisterium of the Catholic Church, that would be more the way to judge between a true versus okay. false mystic. Good. So, but there, there are, mm. yeah, some weak connections, I would say, right. but you, you don't want to absolutize them or, or right. anything like that. And maybe down the road we'll we'll do some more programs talking about the natural law since it's uh, something. Oh, that, sure, uh, absolutely. People, That's a big subject. It's an important yeah. thing for people to understand, especially for Catholics. Uh, next up, yeah. another question, this one from Facebook. Uh, I like the initial question, then it goes off a little bit, but how does one acquire the gift of mysticism? I want to basically focus on that. They go on to say, uh -huh. to see the holy souls in purgatory, to see apparitions of Our Lady and the saints, I love to read about them as I find them fascinating, but all the more better to experience them in person. This is from Donna. So I think I'd like to focus more on the idea, you know, can one go and acquire the gift? And is it something, yeah, even it, as we go yeah. past that, that someone could set their sights and say, well, I want to ultimately be in the unitive way, so I'm now going to follow these steps to get there. Yeah, okay, well, first of all, you know, uh, let me just distinguish, you know, mysticism, um, you know, is not necessarily having visions of people in purgatory or apparitions of Our Lady, though that could be a part of a mystic's life. Right. Uh, mysticism um, may or may not have visions or apparitions attached to it. It really is the unity that produces that very pure sense of being in union with God, finding one's true self in authenticity, authenticating love, you know, to the point where it, it's really perfectly uh, authentic through the, 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 the union that I have with God and the ecstasy that comes therefrom. So that, that it, and that ecstasy, right, is complex. Mm -hmm. It has sacredness in it, home in it, unity in it, joy in it, etc. So it's, it's a complex kind of feeling, all interwoven together with God's signature. Now that's more uh, what we mean by, by mysticism, and it comes from union with the absolute, not absorption with the absolute, uh, or with God. Mm -hmm. So now getting to your point, you know, uh, you know at, at, at the first part of your question, uh, can you uh, sort of say, I'm going on a quest to be become a mystic. Right. Well, well, first of all, uh, you know, in a way, you can dispose yourself absolutely, uh, you know, to, uh, to a mystical life. And that's normally what we call a contemplative life, uh, which, uh, and if you, you wanted to do that, you would enter it generally into a monastery uh, where that would be, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, disposing oneself uh, to the kind of purification mm -hmm. that comes through the, the act of dark night. Uh, remember last week when we were talking about the act of dark night, 
of the senses, mm -hmm. the uh, passive dark night of the senses, right. the active dark night of, of the spirit, and the passive dark night of the spirit. Now, if, if you enter into a monastery with that as your intention, and you, you, you want to, to move through those dark nights because, not because you want to be a mystic, not because you want to have visions, not because you want to have ecstasy, but you're doing this so you can enter into union with the Lord you love. Mm -hmm. You want to dispose yourself to that kind of purification. And the purification is pretty intense. If you want to dispose yourself to that purification because you want to achieve greater authenticity, you want to get your ego out of the picture, not you, but you want God to help you get your ego out of the picture, and you want to get into closer and closer union with Him so He can bring you to the fullness of yourself, and, and, and the joy, the ecstasy, which is a consequence of that, right, uh, will come to you. But if you're seeking the union, and you dispose yourself to the union, yes, you could, uh, uh, you know, God is going to give the joy which will naturally arise, uh, you know, or supernaturally arise with uh, that union. But the right. objective is not to quest the mysticism or the right. a vision or a, or a, um, or a, uh, 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 right, you know, otherwise a, you a could, set of feelings you could, or ecstasy. You could be yeah. like Simon Magus, I guess, uh, from the, you know, yeah. in a sense, coming, thinking, I'm going exactly. to, how can I teach me this so I can have this power, even if it's, if it's done for a, a better idea. Let me ask you yeah. that question with, in that sense. Let's say someone's mm -hmm. on the path and they're, you know, can somebody find themselves in the unitive way and then, I guess, due to free will, decide they don't want to be there anymore? No way. Okay. I mean, uh, th that's that's literally a contradiction in terms. Okay. I mean, if you went into union with God, and you experienced that joy, but of course you you you'd be completely purified, mm -hmm. right? So there'd be no changing your mind at that point. I mean, you know, along the way you might have some chances of bailing and going, you know, into some kind of crazy thing along the path. But once you enter into the unitive way, once you enter into union, once that purification is complete and once you have authentically and completely been purified and chosen God in that way, there's just no possible mm -hmm. way you'd ever, uh, you'd ever bail. I mean, uh, I mean, you'd not only be in ecstasy, but mm -hmm. also you will have, you know, there wouldn't be any inauthenticity left in you uh, any ego left in you to want to bail with, mm -hmm. you'd be you'd have found the fullness of yourself through God. And right. what else could you yeah. possibly want? And the joy would be, as Jesus calls it, y your joy would be complete. So then, if if you were in that situation, you weren't there in the first place, I guess. Really, right? That's, I mean, yeah, you'd have to really go. That's right. You you weren't in the first place. You, there's right. plenty of chances to bail, particularly in the purgative way. You know, you could sort of, uh, it, it, like I said in the in the last show, in the purgative mm -hmm. way, you already have a fairly strong faith life, mm -hmm. and and so you know the idea of actually turning and going away from that in the midst of uh, mm -hmm. uh, even the first stage of, of of purification, namely the purgative way, is not very likely well, because you have a is, very, very good faith life. Um, I guess that would be yeah, pretty painful spiritual. as well, that turning away process. Because, oh, yeah. Right, so. Oh, yeah. I mean, you would feel so much emptiness and pain from that turn. Right. I mean, you would feel so lonely, mm -hmm. so alienated from yourself by that turn. I mean, if you were anything like me, you would be like a rubber band you'd be right back in the presence of God. Help me to reform, Lord. But I, I do think that St. John of the Cross tells us, though, spiritual pride, that's the one yeah. thing in the purgative way, you got to really watch mm -hmm. out for it. Because, you know, when you start thinking, I'm doing more good than you are, right. or you start thinking you're pretty hot stuff because mm. you're making progress in the spiritual life. Right. Beware because then, you know, John, John would say, be, you're, you're in trouble. You're, you could be cannon right. fodder right. for the evil spirit. Well, we call you from now and on. You'll take full advantage. From now on, I'll refer you as the rubber band man, as the, the old song went from the 
the 70s there. And, and I just wanted to mention that you've got a wonderful new book uh, on suffering available yeah. through religious catalog, Light Shines On in the Darkness, Transforming Suffering Through the Faith. And of course, Father Spitzer, the great news is that uh, starting next week, we're going to start going through that book uh, almost chapter by chapter. Yeah. So in a sense, like a little yeah. study as well, and that should be exciting. So we shall see you next Great. week, and we'll begin talking about The Light Shines On in the Darkness. As always, that's the way we always feel when we are joined by Father Spitzer. Don't forget Mother Angelica's Quick Guide to the Sacraments, a new book just out through our publishing arm. and. Uh, Again, Mother Angelica on Suffering and Burnout is also another fine book, one that we just released before this one. And remember next week, I'm going to talk about The Light Shines On in the Darkness with nine Christian foundations for suffering well. There is a way to do that. And don't forget, we have Encore airings throughout uh, the week, Thursday, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, and Saturday, midnight Eastern. And of course, don't forget, we're also available on radio. Listen on radio. Fridays at 8 p.m. and also Saturdays at 12 p.m. Eastern. Great programming always here on EWTN. Thank you once again for joining us at the intersection of faith and reason. See you next time.